Hi there, I'm Deep Dylan. Welcome to your AI Injection, the podcast where we discuss state-of-the-art techniques and in artificial intelligence with a focus on how these capabilities are used to transform organizations, making them more efficient, impactful, and successful. Welcome to this week's episode of your AI Injection. This week, we've got Dr. Werner Kopf. Werner worked for a number of years at Amazon and has served as a tech exec and CTO at a number of companies, including Expedia, Ticketmaster, Conversica, and now Carrot, the startup bringing some tech savvy to technical interviews. Today, we're going to talk about leveraging AI, but from the perspective of a seasoned CTO, Werner Thanks for being our guest on the podcast here. I'm stoked to chat with you about AI from a business leadership perspective and ideally dig in on some of the experiences you've had um, in the industry and things that have shaped your thinking around AI. So uh, with that, I want to start by going way back in time. Uh, You got your PhD in theoretical nuclear physics from the Technical University of Munich. So What's your elevator pitch for your work back then um, for us non-physicists? You know, tell, tell me, tell me like, yeah, how did you get into physics? What was the passion, you know, and, and what were you actually working on? Sure. Hey, uh, Deep, uh, f- thanks for having me on your show. Uh, so I, uh, I guess I was always really good in math in, uh, you know, all the way from <laughs> uh, primary school, from middle school, through high school. Like, you know, when I was like maybe, nine years old, I was walk around uh-huh. the classroom, help the other students. So doing something in math and physics was, uh, you know, was kind of like a given. I wasn't really that good with languages or the liberal arts or anything like that. So math was it. Uh, actually, I started studying to become a math and physics high school teacher in Germany. Uh, there's like a special master's for that. And then uh, once I got into it uh, and I had the uh, opportunity to do a couple of practica at, uh, or internships at schools, it was clear that those working with kids is kind of, you know, it's his own, it's got his own challenges. So I really liked the math and the physics part. And then I got a, uh, a master's in physics and then stayed on for my uh, PhD. Uh, even during my master's thesis and then also for my PhD, I always did uh, basically model calculations around electron scattering or the structure of the nucleus. And it was always a good combo of doing some stuff on with pencil and paper and then putting it uh, on a computer. Like my master's thesis, we were, we were the brilliant idea was that we were gonna determine some of those like levels that a nucleus has when it rotates. And we're gonna do that by applying the theory of general relativity. And by basically transforming into that system of a rotating nucleus, and then uh, from that getting to those to those discrete levels, which in in practice meant like literally hundreds of pages of like uh, equations where we try to we basically transform the Lagrangian of a static uh, nucleus into a rotating coordinate system, and there was like hundreds of terms that came up that at the end almost all of them canceled out, and then you were left with a you know a partial differential equation that I put on a computer and then solved and then generated some graphs and then published a paper. And I realized out of that whole process that part about writing the code and so like having to QA myself and having to verify that, you know, whatever I'm doing actually made sense. And I didn't forget the two or somewhere in the denominator or put a minus sign where a plus sign should go. So I always, you know, had to come up with different ways of getting to the same result to verify that what I was doing was actually correct, that I had a lot of fun doing it. So when, uh, uh, you know, when it was time to get a real job and uh, I got my PhD in, I think, 1991. And then I did a couple of postdocs, did like six years of postdocs in Seattle and Tel Aviv at Ohio State. So after those postdocs, I was looking both to get a professorship and get a real job. And then I guess the real world won out. So... Why? Like, how, how did, how did the, like, what, what attracted you to the real world? Cause I know that, um, I don't know if it's the fake world. I mean, we are talking about the elements of the universe here, but like, uh, Academia. yeah, like what, what was it about what's going on in, you know, in, I don't know, in, in business, in, you know, in kind of the much more applied practical world that you kind of, you were attracted to. And I guess, that's a good question. I guess I've always somewhat maybe been a, a 
a victim or a, and also uh, uh, been able to embrace opportunity. So I was a postdoc at uh, Ohio State and uh, I had applied for a couple of professorships. At that time, the field I was in, there was a lot of uh, folks that come over from, because the wall had just come down a while ago, uh, from the Eastern Bloc uh, that I was competing with. And I had like, you know, maybe 30 papers and they had like 300 papers and we were both going for the same jobs. Mm-hmm. I was on a short list at the University of Saskatchewan. And then uh, right before I was gonna fly there and give my uh, colloquium, uh, I was actually also uh, one of the jobs I had applied for was in San Diego. And then uh, one of our postdocs from Ohio State worked at Fair Isaac, which was a credit card fraud detection company uh, in, uh, in San Diego. And I you know, was going to like visit him and say hello and then uh, just chat a little bit about you know, what his day to day looked like because it was uh, kind of like in a unique hair come out of the same out of the same background that I was and uh, he seemed to enjoy his job. And then when I got there, they actually they had a candidate scheduled for that, that particular day. And then the candidate didn't show up and they basically ran an interview on me without really telling me. So all of a sudden I was like interviewing for a job at Fair Isaac uh, without even having applied. And then, you know, they, at the end, they made me an offer. Uh, at that time, I had just, uh, I had one kid and one on the way. We just moved back from uh, Tel Aviv to the States. And uh, my then wife didn't want to move to San Diego, which I uh, still to this day thought was a very poor move because I think it was like, you know, 10 below in Columbus and it was about <laughs> 75 in, in San Diego. And they were like, whoa, it's a cold day. It's like, whoa, you know, it's a, and it was also like a very interesting, a very, it was an interesting job, it was a little bit, smells like, you know, data munging kind of, I think they had malls that they were working around the globe and they were going into different countries. So the job there was going to be tweak those malls for the particulars of a particular country, but still, you know, it was better than uh, Ohio. But I had applied for a job at a company in Pittsburgh uh, where my then wife was from at a neural network company called Neuralware, where they basically had built this like their own proprietary neural network tool that they applied for uh, all kinds of different use cases and actually also sold as a, as a, you know, a downloadable software that people would, uh, that it was hooked into Excel and you could load your data in Excel and then you could, uh, you know, run neural network models on top of it. And then I pinged the, the guy, the CEO and said, Hey, I got a job offer from, uh, from Fair Isaac in San Diego, come on, why don't you want to, why don't you look at my resume now? Because uh, he seemingly had it before. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And, then, and then he did, and then he invited me in, and then he offered me a job on the spot. Uh, so, you know, it's Everybody a little bit, wants uh, to, Everyone wants to dance with the boy that's already dancing with another girl. So, yeah. So. Absolutely. It is way easier to get a job if you already have one. And yes. actually, I, I, it was pretty hard coming out of physics. I wrote like a blog, it was sort of like pre-blog post, but uh, I published on my page at Ohio State, uh, you know, a 20 page guide on how to get a job and how to write your resume and how to network and blah, blah, blah. And then I actually even gave a talk on that at one of the American Physics Society conferences on, you know, about networking in the in the real world. I think in the meantime, it's probably a little more streamlined. At that time, many of my peers ended up at, uh, you know, quants and hedge funds. Yeah, I had a, uh, yeah, I had a colleague. A popular at, uh, destination for uh, physicists. I in know. And in industry looking, that's... Back, looking back at my career, I probably would have uh, significantly increased my earnings, but probably had a little less fun. I, many of the guys that I knew back then, they, they went to hedge funds and now they became traders and, you know, really got into the industry, but they got out of the, you know, the actual matter of things and out of out of really uh you know the technology part and still i mean i don't solve uh you know partial differential equations on in uh, using fortran libraries anymore but i'm still you know it's still still doing tech i'm still you know breaking things apart and putting them back together and thinking about concepts so you know even though i'm in a very different field now i still somewhat feel i didn't you know stray too far away from what i was originally studying you're listening to your AI injection brought to you by Zionix.com. That's X Y O N I X.com. Check out our website for more content or if you need help injecting AI into your organization. Yeah, I can see that. You know, I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot of, you know, technologists, engineers, and, you know, machine learning folks over the years. And for some reason, for, I, I find the, physicists always stand out in their thinking 
and kind of coming at problems from, I don't know, unorthodox directions uh, that can be just really insightful. And I, I feel like I don't really grok uh, their thinking patterns. Like how does it, you know, like, so I, th I think it's, I'm not alone in, in, in sort of identifying that, you know, that, that background has something really special to bring to the field. So t tell me a little bit about the, you mentioned, you know, you, you started seeing these neural networks for the first, like tell me the first time you saw some machine learning or some AI algorithms that, you know, maybe you observed some supervised or, or even unsupervised learning, you know, with these models, like what went through your head? Was it something that was, you know, exciting? Did a light bulb go off or was it like, no, this is just, you know, a, a slightly different algorithm that, you know, like, like, you know, what happened? It definitely was a combo. I think to some degree, it's not all that different than, you know, some of the Monte Carlo simulations or, you know, big uh, partial differential equation stuff we've been doing. Uh, it was, uh, it was clear that in, in actually at NeuralWare, so we built this like, I uh, built this, uh, ultimately this tool, like an inferential sensing tool where, uh, you know, people who work in refineries would take all kinds of data uh, on their plant. And then they would, instead of putting a sensor in the chimney, they would run my software to predict what the NOx emission or whatever was. And then they would get certified by the EPA and we we'll move the plant around a little bit and make sure that whatever my algo was predicting was the same as what uh, the actual sensor said. I think that, that the, the big difference was it was that data played a much bigger role where in, you know, just by, if you, the equations that you have, or they are all, you know, there are, there's been research that derived them. So there really isn't any doubt about them. And then you just basically pretty much straightforward brute force, come up with a solution with, uh, with, you know, AI and machine learning, it's much more a function of how good your data is. Uh, on what really comes out of it and really understanding that, you know, it probably took me, I'm sure I didn't have those thoughts way back then, but now haven't seen this for a long, for quite a while. Uh, it's definitely become more and more apparent to me that it is, it is that combo about what, uh, you know, what, what math are you throwing at it? What computing power are you throwing at it? You know, what's your algo? What's your hyperparameter optimization? All those things. But ultimately it really comes down to what data do you have? And uh, I, I think many of the mistakes that are made in this space are related to trying things where you don't, or, you know, trying to brute force things where you really don't have the data for. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a super important point. One thing before we kind of really dig into that topic, because I think that's a, that's a good one to dig into. Um, I, I'm lately, I've been sort of attracted to this idea of, so you mentioned like you don't always have the right data, right? So, so sometimes you've got, um, the opportunity to really marry the physics-based world and the and those sort of physics-based simulation approaches with this kind of uh, you know machine learning-driven, data-driven, AI-driven kind of approach. <clears throat> so, for example, I've uh, you, you're starting to see systems where, like, let's say, take something like uh, self-driving cars data. So you've got you know you've got cars out out there driving all over the place, but let's say you want to teach them about you know stop signs. So you've got all this information coming in on stop signs, but specifically, you know, you, you want to teach them about how to read a stop sign, even though there's graffiti all over the stop sign. I mean, you can imagine just coming up with a straightforward physics-based simulation of graffiti and generating a ton of ground truth data. Um, you know, this is sort of, you know, one thing that we did something similar once we were, we were analyzing a lot of in-body surgery data. And uh, one of the things that happens is we, we were trying to classify when this cauterizer is being used, when you're actually cauterizing flesh. And we realized we didn't have enough training data for when, um, um, you know, for when this, like, actually we were looking at some other signals like suturing inside of the body, but a lot of times when cauterizing was going on, you'd get all the smoke that would obfuscate um, the, the actual needle and thread. So we started putting in fake smoke into the scenes to basically get a ton of training data. So I'm curious if you've thought, you know, like, is sometimes it feels like things go, come full circle and you're seeing a lot of uh, physics-based approaches being introduced into the ground truth or training data uh, generation process. I'm curious if you've given any of that, any thought. So way back then in Nordo where we tried, we, we married some of the, cause you were uh, basically software and then we got bought by Aspen Technology, which is a big, uh, you know, software company for the petrochemicals. We definitely married some, some data 
driven or some you know models based on data with models based on first principles and you know partial differential equations uh, i think definitely you know as a i think in machine learning it's all about using whatever tools you have at your, your disposal to solve a particular problem and uh you know it's like why would i why would i have a model have a model do all the hard work to relearn you know what i already know and so if i can input what i already know like the fact that you know those two those two variables are related by a, you know by an equation where you know the second one is one over the other times 450 plus 12 uh, why would i spend all the energy to you know build them all that really, really comes up with that i think that the trick in designing some of those systems then is how do you actually you know put the two together where you know it's not really not necessarily always straightforward right yeah, so I mean, it's, you, it's could, you could yeah. you could clearly you could generate if you know what the what the physical relationships are you could basically generate data that like encapsulates that right yeah yeah and it's it, it i mean I've, it's definitely i mean i've been in these scenarios where you're introducing this generated data and you just can't help but feel kind of i don't know goofy about it because because it's it's data that can be represented way more compactly but just due to our understanding of how to train these models we end up blowing it up into a bajillion examples the whole the whole thing sort of feels odd, but in the end, it achieves that that kind of goal. Um, so tell me tell me a little bit. You I know you were at Amazon during maybe not the early early days, but you know certainly earlier than today. What was what was your transition into Amazon like, and what kinds of you know I, uh, I'm, I, what kinds of like data data science machine learning stuff were you sort of exposed to or thinking about back in those days? I Amazon I was more. Uh, so I came in as I was, was called a two pizza team leader. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it was a, rich, a phrase that actually, uh, Rick Dalzell, who had come into Amazon, he was the CIO, I think of Walmart. Uh, and he could like coined that phrase and it was those teams. They were very, like, very independent of each other. Uh, that had a very, that had a clear mission. We were all supposed to have a fitness function, uh, which was like a one dimensional chart uh, that showed how well my team was doing. And then you would spend a good bit of time iterating on what that fitness function was. You would meet with Jeff and his team to, you know, debate what the fitness function was. Uh, so I owned basically gifting. So it was kind of like a regex, anything that had gift in the name on the Amazon retail side, I owned all the way from the baby and wedding registries and the wish list. Uh, the gift wrap uh, for a while I owned gift certificates which is like a pretty big business I think we did the math at some point I think we were like the four or fifth largest store at Amazon at that point so we had like you know a couple of hundred million a year even back then flowing from my features with a, you know a team of team of like 15 engineers uh, so uh, <laughs> I think I wasn't I think at Amazon for me it was like a, a crash course in how to manage engineering at scale, how to think at scale, how to think about metrics, uh, how to work backwards from the customer. Uh, we used machine learning a little bit. Uh, we did some campaigns uh, where we would, you know, basically uh, uh, optimize, show things on the, on the Amazon homepage that were on your wish list or, you know, other things related to gifting, but it was much more, uh, you know, a consumer of that. Uh, it, it was more, it wasn't so much about machine learning, it was more about, you know, retail and, and execution there. So maybe switching gears a little bit, like I know since you left Amazon, you know, you've been in um, and, and helped kind of really accelerate a number of um, organizations into kind of, um, you know, both development uh, and, and nice kind of tech uh, stack orgs that can kind of produce and write software quickly and rapidly and achieve something. But I know for the last few years, at least, you've definitely been focused a lot more on kind of machine learning based systems. What do you think are like the differences from a cultural standpoint of between getting, you know, product managers, developers, you know, to, to like develop kind of more traditional software versus in this machine learning world where you've got uncertainty, you've got data sets, you've got uh, you know, all that, like, what advice would you give to, you know, other, you know, technology leaders, you know, CTOs, product leaders, et cetera, on, you know, what that difference is and like how, how to kind of navigate that? Uh, may, maybe I, I start with answering the, the opposite of your question. 
I think there is a lot of similarities about data science, machine learning, AI-driven projects being successful in regular projects being successful. It's how well, and it's, a lot of it is on the product side. How well do you really understand your customer? How well is there really a problem there? And how well are you equipped to solve that problem? Uh, you know, I spent some time at a startup where it was pretty unclear what the problem was. It was pretty clear we didn't have the data. It was pretty clear, well, and therefore, you know, we didn't get very far. Uh, I think at uh, Conversica, is almost like very much the opposite. They found a very well-defined pro problem. Uh, they came up with a very well-defined, relatively narrow, but like very powerful solution for it. And they, they ran with it. I think it's all about, I mean, in general, I think in software, uh, and uh, I haven't always, I haven't switched over into product. I'm always dabbled a little bit in between either right now, I own product as well, temporarily uh, back at my previous companies. I think my, one of my most, you know, intense interactions with, was with our head of product. I think for an engineering leader, what the team is working on is more important than anything else. I think if they're working on the right stuff, you can always make it work. I think, so that's, I think where the, where the similarities are. It's just about good product management, figuring out what the problem is, prioritizing right, you know, narrowing it down, MVP, getting something out, getting feedback, working backwards from the customer and good things are going to happen. The, the, the additional dimension with machine learning comes in that there is that, I think with regular software, if you build a, you know, another payment system, it, there isn't really any unknowns on how, what, you know, what the, so like what the equations are that tie all that together. People are going to put money in their wallet and they're going to use your thing to pay at a store and you're going to have to sign up the stores. You know, there's like, it's all known. On the AI side, my experience has been like when you talk to like, you know, the CEO or you talk to people on the board or you talk to the product people, they have no idea to distinguish between what is totally trivial uh, what is doable with a good bit of work and it was completely impossible. And, it's be, and so it's almost because there is this, so that makes product, that makes figuring out what to do and even like an order of magnitude harder. Because now you have to either, keep, you know, if you tell them, hey, I don't think we can do that. Well, did they really hear that? Or do they just think you're not working hard enough? Or is it when you tell them, well, we can't do that because we have, we don't have that kind of data. Well, okay, now it's about getting that data. So I think it just becomes a lot more, uh, it's almost like there's a, a additional degrees of freedom that in regular software, you don't have to worry about. And it's the, hey, it's that, you know, how good do I, do I have to write data? And can I actually, you know, can I actually solve the problem I have? While in most predictable, straightforward, algorithmic, you know, kind of like the regular software we all do, it's more, you know, that typically is not known. Yeah. I think that's very well said. Um, there's, and sometimes you even run into that with with software. I mean, it, like itself, where sometimes you know folks will see you know feature A and feature B and feature C, and then they'll they'll think, okay, that, well, those seemed like really hard things because you know from whatever vantage they have, but feature D, you know, when the developers say, oh, by the way, we, we we're going to need a new platform for that, or we're going to need to you know we're going to have to completely re-architect to support that case. Sometimes you have that, a, a similar kind of thing where they're like, what? I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> like, why, why would that be right. the case? And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely one of the challenges. So one uh, question I wanted to ask you is like, do you see some pitfalls for organizations that are trying to leverage AI um, that they should kind of avoid? Sure. I'm a huge fan of doing prototypes and doing proofs of concept. So before uh, in, I think in AI powered software, I, I think it's even more important than in, in, in regular software. Like in is part of the scrum process is what's called a spike, which is basically when the team, they don't really know how much work it's gonna be and how to do it. So they spend some time where the outcome really is knowing how hard it is and how to do it. And I think in AI driven projects, that is a much, much bigger margin. Like you could be, it could be, you could be two years away from really having a product. So what you want to do to like de-risk that is you want to build prototypes, you want to like work your way there. And you want to say like, 
somewhat have, a, have an idea of where you want to go. And based on that idea where you want to go, you want to decompose it in small steps that allow you to get there. And every one of those steps is basically is proving to yourself that that is still, that's still possible. Now, ideally, while you do that, you get it out, you get some feedback from customers, but you got to look, I think you have to much more look at it as a, you know, as a, I know it's <laughs> funny to use that phrase, is a learning journey in a, where I know ultimately maybe you apply deep learning and you train a neural network that's got a billion parameters, but ultimately it's also, you are also learning what you can do with the data that you have, what your customers are going to do with the product you gave them. Maybe you get better data and now your product gets better. So I think it's the, it's that understanding that this is much more about, you know, figuring things out than shipping something you've already figured out. Once you figured it out, it becomes a machine. Like at Conversica, you know, we basically figured out how to train models to understand those conversations. And then it becomes, okay, now we have like hundreds of models and now we have to build, you know, we have to build software and that tracks how well those, are, how well those models are doing. We have to build dashboards, we have to build monitoring, but now I'm like back at, okay, or I'm, you know, running 5,000 servers at Amazon and I have to figure out what the CPO is and what the memory is and how well my service is doing. You can then, then it maps back to like, hey, just good old engineering. But I think on the, on the, when conceiving a new product, I think you gotta, you gotta understand that and have that modesty that a lot of the time you really don't know what you're doing. And it's about, figuring it out, which is part of the journey. Yeah, which I think, I think you know, not, not to throw in the plug for you guys, which is a lot of the time, and I think physicists, <laughs> we're good at recognizing there is stuff that's similar to other stuff. And then we apply, you know, partial differential equations or rules or math from domain one in domain two, and then everybody's happy and somebody gets a Nobel Prize. I think, <laughs> in, <laughs> I think, a lot of also in like machine learning, it's like some, a lot of those problems, they, you know, in a higher dimensional space, they map to each other. So the fact that you've already seen this over here allows you to apply, apply it over there where, you know, while many companies doing this for the first time, they totally don't have that, you know, they don't have that breadth of, of a perspective. And I think that's very, a very powerful tool. Yeah, I mean, that's something that, you know, I, I know we, we do a lot of, we see a lot of different projects because we're working with, you know, with a number of teams and you definitely find, you know, you, you find these things working in, you know, one domain really well. And then they can, you, you just see that pattern, you can lift it. Like one I've been, uh, you know, just kind of reading about recently is, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, the power of these, you know, these generative uh, models, particularly in text, they've gotten a lot of popularity where we, right. we train these, these massive models like GPT-3 to basically, you know, take all of the world's kind of text information, predict the next word predicts the next sequence of words, the next sentence, things like that. And then with that relatively straightforward kind of thing, um, it turns out that these uh, machines are, are marvels at just generating you know, text. And then you can kind of flip it on its head and like with something like GPT-3, you can now, you know, in inputs, you, you put in an example in English, a translation in French, example in English, translation in French, all of a sudden it can translate a whole language. Um, the same model, that you can give it, you know, the opening sentences, you know, to Alice in Wonderland, and it'll start writing in that style. And it's kind of, it's kind of wild. But to your to your point about seeing things in different domains, you know, lately we've been looking at at music, for example, and some of the systems coming out of OpenAI, where folks are able to take that same approach that's worked so well in in text, but they're doing it in music, and now they're able to, you know, kind of in a you know, with unfortunately not the fidelity level um, that's, that is not quite there, but you're able to like get something to like finish a song. So you start with like Nirvana lyrics or something or Nirvana, the actual tune of something, and it can just author an entire piece, which is kind of mind blowing if you, if you, if, if you think about it. Um, one question I had for you is like, you know, we've had this gigantic kind of demarcation in the, you know, in the machine learning world. It's kind of like, pre and post deep learning, if you will. Perhaps you're not sure whether AI can really transform your business. Maybe you don't know what it means to inject AI into your business. Maybe you need some help actually building models. Check us out at zionix.com. That's X-Y-O-N-I-X.com. Maybe we can help. 
I'm curious from a from a CTO slash business practitioner vantage, did you see a difference from pre deep learning when you know I don't know I, I feel like we were kind of sitting around kind of mid 80s in terms of percentage of accuracy for things like translation language translation, et cetera, to all of a sudden, all, it felt like almost overnight just being overwhelmed with how good these things started working. Like, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, all, all these different models, I'm curious from your vantage, did you notice a big shift ar around that time? And um, if so, like, how did it affect your thinking with respect to maybe, you know, helping out a new startup or a new, a new project or a new organization? Yeah, it's a, so I, you know, reminisce with some of my, uh, you know, physics colleagues on, hey, you know, we did like, I mean, I literally built neural network models back in the 90s, but uh, clearly it wasn't deep learning. Uh, I was on a DARPA project when I was at uh, work for a company in Pittsburgh, and uh, they were basically using uh, one of the one of the efforts was, uh, you know, uh, natural language understanding, uh, like voice, basically, to run a command post. And it was just like, wasn't working well enough to make any impact. And, you know, here five years later, or, you know, maybe a little more, 10 years later, 15 years later, we got, you know, Alexa and we got, it's totally become mainstream. And the reason is if that thing is 80% accurate or 85% accurate, it's worthless. And if it's 95% accurate, it's perfect. So it seems like a relatively small change, but it makes all the difference. So I think what, so number one, I think what, in what has what has happened there it has crossed that threshold where it's good where it's good enough to really do its job while before it was just below that threshold and it wasn't good enough to do its job uh, what i'm sometimes you know there's a, a google commercial where they say hey you know only google can do that in uh, some of the you know sometimes i think it's worrisome for startups on whether we'll be able, I mean, we can't compete with, you know, the big fan companies on some of the, what they're developing or the models, like GP, you mentioned GPT-3. I mean, to train that model is like, what, hundreds of millions of dollars. So I'm not gonna, I mean, either they make it available to the rest of us, yeah. or or it's something that we'll, we'll never be able to get to that level of, uh, you know, Which get to that level of- yeah, I mean, and apparently it pales in comparison to this new Wu Dao 2.0 that just came out, which is uh, trillions of parameters. I mean, it's just we have yet to see that publicly, but I mean, it's just mind-boggling the scale at which we're competing on some of these projects. And you know, of course, the big tech companies that have these vast data repositories are the ones that can really kind of push the envelope on some of these basic um, 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 kind of standard tasks, if you will, like you know, language translation, transcription, speech transcription, etc. Right. And I think that the real enabler for startups is to, you know, is to have access to that. I mean, you know, you sort of mentioned like advice to companies doing that. Like if you are building, you know, if you're building your own model, if you're building your own algorithms or you're writing like proprietary software rather than using some of the libraries or using some of the open source stuff, you are doing, I mean, unless you're one of the, you know, unless you're one of the really main big, uh, you know, high tech tech companies that have a reason to do that, you're definitely doing something wrong. Whatever your problem is, there is definitely an open source algo out there that's all set already. Most likely, there is already training data out there that could help you a lot. So, you know, please do it. Do as little as possible on your own and reuse as much as you know what's already out there is what. Yeah, I, I think that's fantastic advice. Like, you know, there's just such an insane amount of building blocks to stand on now. And there's building blocks on the code level, on the in the in the machine learning library level. There's building blocks on data with transfer learning, uh, and then there's even building blocks at the service level, where you know if you're a startup and you're trying to do something, you know, with speech transcription or speech diarization, you know, the big you know the the big uh, tech companies have their version. AWS has got theirs, or Amazon's got theirs, Google's got theirs, and looking for where where you can sit and maybe. Um, and, and, niche down or like kind of like focus in a particular niche so that you can kind of get out of their crosshairs. One question, one thing you mentioned that I, I kind of want to go back to is you mentioned like during the kind of deep learning transition, um, you know, or like just these, or this, this kind of translation transition from when we used to talk about machine learning and not be able to use like, you know, AI, you know, with a straight face, there was this transition where suddenly like we went from, you know, you mentioned 85 to 95% and, and, and things became feasible that weren't. A lot of times, though, we do have um, we like even ninety five percent could be too little. And 
going back to the organizational question, like how do you think about communicating with like, you know, product managers, for example, when you start saying like, hey, this thing works, you know, 92% of the time, 93% of the time, but it fails. Like, is there a conversation that you find yourself having regularly around like how to, for example, hide the errors or, or your expectations are out of whack. Like we're never going to get to 99%, um, that sort of thing. No, definitely. I, I remember, you know, conversations with my head of uh, customer service at Conversica and, you know, he would like quote uh, a response where, you know, a, a customer had emailed in and then how we responded and how the client had witnessed that and how wrong that was. And I said, well, you know, that's one out of 10,000. So, you know, we're at 99.9%. Uh, and he was like, well, but I don't care. And they're upset. And I think it's, uh, well, and I actually at the end didn't have a good answer because he had the right, he had the customer had the right to be upset, but the customer didn't really understand that we're looking at a probabilistic model here that once in a while, it's going to make a mistake. But he didn't really, they didn't really, want to hear that because, you know, it was actually their customers that we were interacting with. I think I would say the best way out of that is sort of, is out of like in, you know, in software, there's like a strong consistency and eventual consistency. If you have to build something that has to be strong, strong with strong consistency, that's way harder, way slower, way more expensive, way worse. If you can get away with eventual consistency, you know, like if you got a stream of news a stream of posts on your homepage and you don't really know when I posted it, eventually it's going to show up and you still think it's a great product. Uh, you have, it's way easier. I think even in, also in that space, if you can make it so you can forgive or the user will forgive mistakes, you're in a much better position. But that's again, is like a design innovation product problem. I think if you, if you really, it has to work a hundred percent of the time, it just, you know, it will not. It's like, yeah. it's just like humans don't work hundred percent of the time. So it's, but it's kind of like either building it in or understanding that in kind of like designing with that in mind from the, from the, from the ground up. Yeah. I think that's a, you know, that's a really good point. One of the things that I talk to, uh, you know, folks about a lot is um, there are error rates and then there are perceived error rates. And so to the extent that you can decrease the perceived error rates, you know, the better. So for example, you know, you've got, you've got a thing that humans look at, you don't have to lead with a random sample of whatever your machine learning thing is doing. You can lead with the very high confidence cases and then you can tuck the other ones underneath a more or something, you know, you can like hide them and you see that happening all the time out there. Uh, but sometimes it's, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a challenge to like, you know, sort of navigate the inevitable errors of machine learning. And I, I find that like, that's kind of what differentiates the great um, organizations uh, at machine learning from the sort of ones who are new to it or aspiring is that the great ones are able to do kind of two things. One, they're able to like mitigate the person, you know, the, the, the efficacy. And at the same time, they're able to keep pushing and move that statistical batch, uh, you know, that, that floor of efficacy. So the probability that a customer sees a high value case and calls up a salesperson starts to decrease over time. Right. So cool. Right. One one, uh, one question I had for you is like, I mean, maybe just wh when have you seen this all working perfectly, <laughs> like in, in like harmony, maybe like, or, or, or what would you describe as like, you know, maybe the perfect team makeup and project slash organizational um, composition where machine learning is happening, data is being gathered, the product is improving, customers are being happier, like, I don't know, what, what, what does that whole worldview look like to you? Like to just kind of characterize that. In my actual background or in my perceived imaginary- uh, <laughs> Maybe a, both, <laughs> maybe a bit a, of in both. In a perfect world. <laughs> so I think, uh, well, so I think at Carrot right now, we, we have a strong, good product. We have great product market fit. Uh, we're in the fortunate position that uh, it works with or without machine learning. And we're using now machine learning to improve the product, to help with the alignment, to help with the alignment, like basically how we, how we set those levels on when somebody passes or fails. Uh, 
So we have a separate data science team. Uh, they have, you know, they have their own roadmap. They are kind of like focused on more R&D activities. So I think, so that is, I think a good model where you realize, you distinguish between, hey, I'm doing R&D, where the payoff is a little further out to I'm um, building it into the product. I have another, you know, way back then at Expedia, we built, uh, built a new hotel sort. Uh, took a while to get that out the door. And originally we thought it was just about sorting hotels the right way. It turned out uh, that we, once that we got that to work, Expedia used that to have hoteliers bid on their sort position. So we will basically simply factor in on how much margin they were giving us. And based on where, how much margin they were giving us, the hotel would move up or down. Uh, not sort of like ignoring customers' preferences because if you move it up and nobody clicks on it, nobody's happy anyway. So it was kind of like us being able, so, but you could only launch that product if you had an algorithm that would sort the right way such that you could actually bid on it. So it's, I think it's sometimes, I love those like multi plays where you build something and then once you have it working, you all of a sudden have a new play that you could make on top of that first play. Uh, so that was a good example of that. Uh, I think I convert, and then I think sometimes what I, what I'm a, one of my catchphrases from way back then is like, we get that for free. Uh, so frequently I'm not in a position where I get stuff for free, but sometimes <laughs> I am. So if you build a platform or you build something that does something, and then when you want to extend it, it kind of like is already there. You know, I think there's examples, I think we all have where, you know, that that has worked out. So I think whether it's just regular software or, or the, the domain we're in, if you have, if you build something that, you know, you can extend to something that the business wants to do without really a lot of work, that is a super powerful paradigm. And, uh, you know, I think that's kind of like all, always we, what, something we should strive for. Fantastic. I want to ask you one uh, final question. No AI interview is complete without it. Um, the singularity, Terminator prophecies, your general AI vision for the future, like where is all this stuff going in the long arc, you know, in the, in the physicist timeline? Um, like where, where are we headed? Right. Uh... You know, I think it was in the early uh, 20th century where we had uh, physicists were under the impression that we had discovered everything and uh, it was going to be a real bore for, you know, going forward. And then there was quantum mechanics and, uh, <laughs> and Einstein and all kinds of new things. So I think humans are really, really, really bad at those predictions. Um, so uh, number one, that. And number two, we're so far well so number one we're so far away from the actual you know from the actual if you do look at what what would require or something like that uh, to happen and then we also another way of being really wrong at predicting things is ignoring the changes that are going to happen based on the things that just happened like if we're going to get if ai is going to get much better and better. We're also going to get much better in working with AI, understanding AI and incorporating AI in our daily life. And the predictions we're making today about the singularity is ignoring all those changes that we're going to make to our own lives and the way we look at it and the way we interact with it. And then it looks like really scary. So long story short, uh, I don't think anybody has to worry about that. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. That's all for this episode. Uh, as always, uh, to our audience, thanks so much for, uh, for, for sticking around and, and learning about, um, you know, what a great CTO like Werner um, uh, thinks about how to bring AI into your organization. And Werner, thanks a ton for, for chatting with me. Um, that's all for your AI injection. That's all for this episode. I'm Deep Dylan, your host, saying check back soon for your next AI injection. In the meantime, if you need help injecting AI into your business, reach out to us at zionix.com, that's X-Y-O-N-I-X.com. Whether it's text, audio, video, or other business data, we help all kinds of organizations like yours automatically find and operationalize transformative insights.